Greetings, truth seekers, paradigm busters, new world order, civil disobedience, freedom fighters, free thinkers, higher mammals, good people of all types. How's it going? My name is Michael Parker, and welcome to the 30th episode. That's right, the big 3 0, the dirty 30, baby, of the Electric Pyramid, coming to you as always from an undisclosed location somewhere in Hollywood, California. And ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you're at, uh, right now it's Thursday, January the 8th for me. Perhaps it is January the 9th for you and Friday somewhere if you're on the East Coast. And uh, this is the second show of 2015. And we'll be joined shortly by a paranormal investigator. I just got through reading her book. Her name is Andrea Message. Her book is The Ghost in the Coal Cellar. And Andrea Message is a skeptic about the paranormal until she had her own dramatic encounter with a ghost in 2004. Since then, she has studied the paranormal, practicing new techniques, testing different theories and researching history, trying to discover why paranormal events happen and what we can learn from them. I have been reading her book this week. It's called The Ghost in the Cold Cellar, True Case Files from a Lone Investigator. It's out through Llewellyn Publications, and I want to say thank you to Llewellyn for forwarding me this review copy. Um, it's a quick read. It's really good. I've, I've kind of torn through it this week. Is Andrea with us, Joe? Hello. Hello, Andrea. Yes. Hey, this is Michael Parker with the Electric Pyramid. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. How are you? Great. I think that we had an incorrect Skype number for you or something, so we ended up, I guess, calling you on the phone. I apologize for that. Okay. No, no, that's no problem. Great. Well, I was just telling uh, the audience about the book. I've been reading The Ghost in the Coal Cellar for the past week, and uh, it's, a, it's a really great read, and I, and I thanked Llewellyn for sending me the uh, review copy. Now, I know that you do a lot of these interviews, and you probably get asked a lot of the same questions. How did you get started in this and everything? And um, <laughs> Yeah. But it's interesting to me because you describe yourself as, you know, a normal Catholic girl with, you know, the, just a lot of interest that most typical Americans would have. But then you yeah. had some incidents of your own that's in your own home. And I was hoping that you could tell the audience about that before we get into the book. Sure, sure. Um, How this <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of where the best place to start would be because it's it's such an odd it's such an odd story. Um, I suppose, you know, I, I'm not going to say it's an odd story because anybody who has been a skeptic that becomes a believer in the paranormal has basically gone through a similar situation that I did, where it's mm -hmm. it starts off with complete denial. It's almost like the stages of grief where you start in denial and, and then you kind of move on to like anger about it. And then you move on to acceptance, it's, you know, in that kind of a stage. But um, yeah, in my in my first experience with the paranormal, I was a complete unbeliever. I, I was, if you told me a paranormal story, I would probably, I may not laugh in your face, but I would laugh behind your back. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just one of the things I did not believe. And I just, I couldn't wrap my mind around the idea of ghosts. And as a Catholic, I always believed there are, three places there's heaven there's hell and then there's the in between which is purgatory mm -hmm. and, and that's i mean a lot of christians kind of dispel that now but in catholicism it's a place where we go to repent of venial sins that we may not have repented of to make ourselves purely clean if before we go to heaven and and that's all i thought i said there is no in between there are no spirits or things like that and it, it was something that was kind of uh foreign to me mm -hmm. so my one day, my brother actually was into the paranormal long before I was. Him and his now wife, uh, my brother Andy and his wife Jamie, were paranormal investigators, and they would travel all over the country to go to different ghost hunts and ghost tours and to learn more about the paranormal. And they had just gone to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and they came home. And my brother still lived with us at the time in my family home before he got married. And um, I don't know what happened. I don't know if he it was something that he brought home as a souvenir from Gettysburg or if it was something that was attached to him from Gettysburg. But as soon as he came home from Gettysburg, all sorts of weird things started to happen. And I just completely ignored everything. I would just say, you know, that's the wind. That's my mom's calling or my mom calling me. And, you know, I just, I, you know, I just found a way to like dispel any kind of like sounds that I heard or phantom voices that I heard or like my soda can getting knocked off a table for no reason. And I just kind of 
you know, eh, it's just, it's normal, it's natural, this is something I can explain away. And then one day, it came to the point where I couldn't explain it away anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, my brother and my other brother, John, were at this, a, it's a party in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, called uh, the Steel Days. And um, it, it's, I guess it's this French thing with lots of food and fun and music, and that's about 45 minutes away from where we lived. And as I'm upstairs in my loft and my mom's in her room in bed, and unfortunately my father had cancer and he was in the hospital at the time. So it was just me and my mother. Mm-hmm. And I heard somebody come home, walk through the kitchen with heavy boots. And my brother, Andy is a true cowboy and he wears the cowboy boots, the 10 gallon hat and you know, the whole deal. And so I thought it was my brother, Andy. And sure enough, I hear the footsteps coming past my, the stairs to my loft and then goes into my brother's room and closes the door. So I go downstairs to see how the party was, and I knock on my brother's door, and the door opens on its own, and it reveals that it's an empty room with the light on. And I had turned the lights off myself before going up to my loft because my mom is a stickler for saving money. I mean, Mm -hmm. if there is a light on in the house that should not be on, she can sense it from another room. So I go, and I, I turn off all the lights. And so I turned off the light and I went to check on my mom to see if my brother had gone to say hi to her. And she said, no, well, it was that him that had just come home. And I thought it was kind of weird. He's not in his room. He didn't go to say goodnight to my mother. He's not in that I could see in the house. So I call him up to see if maybe he had just grabbed something and left. And I could hear in the background that he's still at the party 45 minutes away. Mm. And now I, all of us sci-fi nerds, if you know the show Stargate SG-1, yes. the only way that he could be from our house to the party 45 minutes away is if you walk through the Stargate. <laughs> right. Um, so I immediately thought someone broke into our house. And so I grab a butcher knife and I hand it to my mom. I take a butcher knife. I'm putting knives in the basement door to make sure if someone snuck downstairs, they can't get back up. And then I'm trying to look as aggressive as, you know, a girl can possibly look. And sure. I'm going looking under beds. I'm looking in closets. I'm yelling, you know, like, I know you're here and I'm armed. I have a gun on me and Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be as intimidating as possible. And there's nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. So I go and I turn off the light in my brother's room. And as I'm leaving my brother's room, which was the last room I checked, the light turns back on in its own. And this is not one of those kind of lights where you can kind of push it down halfway and then it pops back up. I mean, down is off, up. There's nothing in between. These are the old school switches. The old, very, I mean, it's a heavy, you could hear that click when you turn it down. And so I go and I turn it down again and I hold it down and they start to back away. And as I'm backing away, I watch it go back up on its own and the lights turn back on. Hmm. Now I'm a little bit freaked out. Um, So I told my brothers that I thought somebody had broken into the house and they came rushing home from the party. They did a perimeter search because they're both police officers. And they could see that their, you know, the ground was muddy and they could only see their footprints, and there was nothing else around the house. All the windows were untouched. The doors that were still locked, um, besides the one that they came in, were still locked. I mean, nothing had been tampered with. No footprints, absolutely nothing. So I didn't know what to say at that point. Nobody had broken into the house, but my mom and I both heard somebody in the kitchen. And after that, all sorts of different activity. It was almost like a switch turned off in my head and it knew that I knew Mm -hmm. that something else was there and all sorts of stuff started to happen after that. Andrea, how long after your brother returned from Gettysburg was it before these events happened? I would say probably a couple weeks. Okay. And in my research, um, now that I'm actually a researcher, I do notice that in a lot of times in the case of like a a spiritual attachment where maybe a spirit is following an object or a person because spirits can attach to people just as much as objects, there is what is called the resting period. It's almost like when you move to a new house and you're kind of like just getting used to it, it doesn't feel like home yet. And you just got to kind of get used to the feel of this new house as being your home. They have to get acclimated. Exactly. That's kind of my theory with spirits. They got to get acclimated. They got to kind of get to know the people that are living there, kind of get to know what, you know, they just don't really, you know, want to just say, hey, I'm here. 
they kind of want to, they're like, this isn't where I was. This isn't where I belong. This is where my thing is. This is where, you know, I, I want to be with this object, but this isn't where we originally were. And I'm kind of confused and I need to acclimate myself. But once that acclimation period is over, usually activity will start to pick up. It's interesting that whatever this was waited until, you know, your brothers were gone. Yeah. Yeah. And and the thing is, it did, there were things that happened when my brother was there, but my brother just never told us oh. um, the light that the lights going on and off. He said that he experienced that, but he just never told us because again, I'm the type of person who would just roll my eyes at you and laugh at you. Mm-hmm. And so he figured what's the point in telling. <laughs> so, right. um, but the odd thing is that happened, I mean, after that, I was sitting in my bed and I was talking to a friend because I was upset. I had just bought a bunch of new batteries and I couldn't find them. And the remote in my TV had died. And I'm not a caveman. I'm not going to go and start flipping the channels manually. That's what <laughs> remotes were made for. I am a girl of technology. Okay, Absolutely. <laughs> I don't do anything manually. And so I'm sitting talking to my friend and 20 minutes into the conversation, the closet is slightly open, but it opens more and a box shoots out of my closet, flies eight feet to where my bed is. And the only thing that stopped the momentum of this box was my bed. Spills out and there's batteries everywhere. And it's all the batteries that I had purchased, you know, a couple weeks earlier. And I tried so many times to recreate that situation. And the Mm -hmm. only thing that I could do, no matter how I placed the box, back in the closet is get it to tip down and fall inside the closet, not actually shoot out and fly eight feet with a right. like fast momentum. So then I started to realize something more is going on here, but it really wasn't the matter of acceptance until after my father passed away. And that was a really tough time for us because my grandmother had just died a few months before my father did. And, um, About a month after my dad had passed, my mom and I had decided to come into the new millennium and we bought ourselves a, it's a voice, like a landline machine with a voicemail, only instead of using those tiny little tapes, it was actually digital. We were really excited because we were like feeling like we were so high class with this digital recorder and we had gotten our first message and we pressed play and we're all excited to hear who our first call was from. And it was all white noise. And then in the middle of the white noise, we heard something that just shocked us. So I immediately called my brother to have him here, and I didn't tell him what we heard. And he was shocked. So he called our other brother who came running home and, again, jaw-dropping to the ground as soon as he heard. And we all looked at each other. We said, that's dad saying I love you. And there's another male voice saying something about, like, there's the light. And then the message cuts off. And paranormal activity in the house stopped at that point. And the only thing that I can think of through my research is that um, whatever spirit was in the house either knew my dad was not long for the world Mm -hmm. and waited to cross over with him because maybe he thought my dad would want company crossing over or maybe he just didn't know how to cross over but knew my dad would because my dad was a very spiritual person. We don't really know what the reason was. All I know is that was my dad's voice saying, I love you. There was an unidentified male voice and then no paranormal activity after that. And that's kind of like what I call the baptism by fire of how I became a paranormal investigator. Understood. So you you mentioned that your dad was very spiritual as well and you were raised Mm -hmm. Catholic. Was he Catholic as well? No, he wasn't. Um, He was, well... (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of a complicated, but he was actually, he was born Catholic. He was baptized Catholic, and then mm-hmm. he was baptized Methodist. And then eventually my grandmother um, on my dad's side started to raise them Baptist. So my dad was Baptist, but he, my mom is Catholic and he, you know, we were raised Catholic and he basically attended our first communions and our confirmations and our baptisms and everything that had to do with the Catholic church. He was always there and he was always very supportive. And I would say that he was more of a Catholic slash kind of like a, he read the Bible all the time on his own. He really, I don't think identified as Baptist or Catholic specifically. He identified as more of a child of God. I get it. And he just read the Bible over and over and he supported my mom and us as Catholics but, you know, I think he kind of had his own little way, his own kind of like way of uh, worshiping God and Jesus and things like that. I understand. Um, the, the, the Catholic religion is interesting to me because 
Um, I, I grew up Methodist as well, and um, it, with, with, with Catholicism, well, actually with religion in general, and, I, and I've been reading your book, and I've been listening to other interviews that you've done with other people, and, and the topic of religion comes up, and, and religion's an interesting thing because mm-hmm. sometimes it seems like people want to believe in religion, but when you talk about paranormal uh, subjects, they kind of sign off. And I would argue oh, yeah, that yeah. Th- that if you're, listen, if you're religious, you are already dealing in the realm of the supernatural already. Exactly. I mean, God himself, whether people want to believe it or not, is paranormal, because the very definition of paranormal are things that cannot be defined under scientific definitions. They, there is no scientific evidence, to, or scientific, I always say scientific for some reason, it's not even <laughs> a word. Um, there's there's no scientific evidence that um, God exists. It's the faith that we believe God exists, and we have proof in our own lives that God exists. But you can't sit down right now, I mean, as of yet, and say, here is scientific proof that, you know, via these different kinds of equations coming together that there is a God. And so by that definition, God would be considered paranormal because it's the same thing with spirits. You can't sit down and write an equation and say, here's proof that ghosts exist or here's proof that Bigfoot exists. You know, it's all within the realm of the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I find that as I go as a researcher now for over a decade, um, it's actually kind of strengthened my faith more or less and my belief in God and, and the things that I have encountered and the things that I've seen is, is something that kind of brought me closer to my religion than I ever felt in the past. So I, I kind of look at them as one and the same. And I mean, if you, if you look at the Bible, because I had such problems when I'm doing research now, including for my second book, you know, I go to different religions just to ask what their opinions are. I don't want to sure. like say, well, you know, you have to believe in it. And I want to know, I, I just, just want to know, like, if you don't believe in it, why? And I found the Catholics are very open, and um, actually many of the religions are very open, except for the Baptists. And I shouldn't say that, because, like, you know, I have half my family are Baptists on my dad's side. But I found them to be very close-minded about it. In fact, I had a lot of ministers that would kind of, like, it it would be, like, just kind of, like, sitting there, like, wanting me to repent and, you know, telling me to get on my knees and say prayers. And, you know, they're talking about me being an occultist and and it's just, it's the oddest thing. And, um, and I finally, I told this one, I said, there are ghosts in the Bible. Do you not understand that this spirituality is all in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Um, if you think of the book of Genesis, the very first ghost story is Adam and, you know, or sorry, not Adam and Eve. The very first ghost story is Cain and Abel because Abel was not in heaven because heaven was not open yet. And God said that he heard, Abel, Abel calling from the ground after he had been killed. Well, if Abel's dead and there are no such things as goats, what was God hearing calling out to him? Good point. Um, and then you have Jesus himself saying when he returned, and everyone was afraid that he was a ghost, and he said, well, look, I, I'm not a ghost. He's not saying ghosts are evil, don't believe in them. All ghosts are demons. There's no such thing as ghosts. He says, I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have flesh and bone, as you can see that I have. So he didn't like to spell say, hey, ghosts don't exist, don't believe in that, it's all evil. He made the def- the differentiation between him and a ghost. So it's in the Bible, I mean, there are things in the Bible. But it's a lot of times when you're dealing with religion, it's so hard for in certain religions, because I know I've dealt with a lot of private clients that say, absolutely do not release any of this information that I'm telling you right now, because my church will literally kick me out. And, and they were, they'd have a stigma on them. Agreed. And that is a shame. I mean, listen, I grew up in Texas. And like I told you, I, I, I was Methodist. Um, yeah. And I think there is a very conservative, well, this is no surprise to anybody, but there's a very conservative element of Southern Protestant type religions. Um, it's, it's a shame that there would be a stigma attached to that. Because like I said earlier, yeah. if you're, if you're in religion, you're already dealing with the supernatural. So I, it, it doesn't surprise me that the, the Catholics would be more forthcoming because when you hear about uh, exorcisms, you you really only it seems to me like hear about priests doing them. Am I yeah. wrong? When you hear about exorcisms, you hear about Catholic priests doing them. Um, I have heard of rabbis in the Jewish faith also mm-hmm. performing exorcisms. I've heard. I've actually heard of other like you. You see the televangelists who do those, like those. Sure. 
that they call exorcisms on TV where someone walks up and then starts to have spasms all over the place. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, that's a lesser extent. I mean, that's, I think a lot of that for show, but uh, yeah, I, I have seen rabbis that have talked about exorcisms and I've seen, and they, in fact, sometimes that they're interfaith where a lot of people will cross over and bring Catholic priests who have been trained in the Vatican for exorcisms and uh, vice versa. Well, one of the th- interesting things when you when you started on this path uh, after the situations in your own home and uh, the the revelation of your father being on the telephone, which must have been incredibly profound to your family, um, mm-hmm. how did you wh- who did you just go to the library or get on the internet? Who did you reach out to initially to start educating yourself on the on this type of material? I actually did go do a lot of research online. Um, I did a lot of research at the library because at the time I did not know that paranormal groups existed and that there were people that are now like me that were out there to help people in these kind of situations. So I didn't really know where to turn to. And that's when I started to do a lot of the research online. It actually wasn't until a year later when ghost hunters became a really big deal Mm -hmm. that I started watching the show. And this was back in the day when they still visited homes like a private residence like mine, and they would help people with paranormal issues. And I started to say, well, that's kind of unique. That's different. That must be a new thing. And so I started doing research online, and I found out it really wasn't a new thing, that paranormal investigative groups have been out there for a long, long time, and that there were people that I could have reached out to uh, to find that kind of help that was free, and it was private and confidential, and it was something that, you know, I I, I could have at least gone and gotten advice from them. And once I knew that they were out there, that's when I started reaching out to various groups to ask their opinions. And um, I started to learn about the equipment they used and about the Mm -hmm. techniques they used. I shadowed a bunch of groups. Um, I I would go to different places, different cities, different states, and I would ask them, well, can I just shadow you? Can I learn from you? Can I see what your technique is and how you use equipment. And I would compare it to another group. And eventually I started to kind of find my own style. And then I just became an investigator who now people will sometimes turn to for my advice or to shadow me and learn from my techniques and so on. Well, a couple of things before we start talking about uh, some of the, the investigations you cover in the book. Another thing I wanted you to explain to the audience that I, I find this fascinating. I've I've interviewed a few um, paranormal investigators in the past, uh, and uh, John Zaffis, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and, and I'll be honest, yeah. I did not know a lot about uh, demonology or ghosts. I, I more know about UFOs and things like that, so I was kind of a newcomer yeah. to to this aspect. Um, explain to our audience what the various types of hauntings are, because. In the book, you explain it very well that there's several different types, and I, I think people will be surprised when they hear um, what these four groups are. Yeah, well, one group, um, there's one group, it's called a haunting, but it actually is not a haunting, and that's residual hauntings. Mm-hmm. And it's it, like I said, the name is a misnomer. It actually is not a haunting. What it basically, a residual is, is I compare it to, and I know I don't know if any of your listeners how old they are, um, but if you're older than 20, you'll remember VHS tapes. Sure. And it, it's kind of like uh, if you went to Blockbuster and they had the Be Kind Rewind stickers. Mm-hmm. That's what a residual haunting's like. It's like playing a videotape, rewinding it, pressing play, and watching it again, rewinding it, pressing play, and watching it again. And it's more like a, it, it's psychic energy that's kind of left in the world. And it could be something that was traumatic or something that was just over joyous, or it was some kind of a deep, deep emotional thing that happened that when there's a trigger, like a door knocking or a phone ringing, it will replay this particular moment in time. You could see a full body apparition or it could be noises. Um, And the prerequisite is that the person involved in, like if you're seeing a full body apparition, that person might not be dead. Uh, which is why this is not necessarily haunting. There was actually a case that I was investigating where somebody had seen this young boy going in and out of the house only when storms would happen. And they would see the same thing, and he would be going up a pair of stairs that were no longer there. The stairs had actually been destroyed in a fire, and when the home was rebuilt, they turned that into an attic with just a pull-down, but there were no staircase. 
but they would see this boy going up the staircase and nothing that they could do could interrupt what this boy was doing. They could call out to him. They could try and stand in his way and he would just go about his business as if they didn't exist. Well, after researching, they found a picture of the boy in um, some archives about the fire because this fire had happened many, many, many decades ago. And what they found out through going through finding this picture and then going through more records was that the boy was now a 90-year-old man living with his wife in a retirement community. Wow. And he went to see this man, and he showed the man the picture. And he's like, well, that's me when I was 16 years old. And the man went through some of his photo albums, and he found a picture of um, himself when he was 16 years old. And sure enough, that was the boy that they had been seeing. So he wasn't even dead. It was just what happened was that the psychic energy that was left behind was in the middle of the fire. And what they finally figured out was when he was going up the stairs, he was going to save his pet dog. And that was such a traumatic experience, he said, because he had gotten severely burned. And when he was trying to lift some, like a banister that had fallen off his dog. And he thought his dog was dead. And it was such a traumatic thing for him because at the time, you know, his father had passed away in the mines and he had lost a lot of family in the mines during the mining community when, you know, mining was really big back then. Mm-hmm. And he was, he said he was very traumatized, but luckily it turned out his dog was still alive and he was able to save his dog and get out of the house. But this was still um, imprinted upon the... It was imprinted. It was such a traumatic event that the psychic energy left this imprint to replay over and over in time like a record. And what's Amazing. really interesting was they believe that a lot of times it's the area itself is can act as a conduit. Like if there's a lot of limestone or quartz in the area, and there is mm-hmm. a lot of limestone in that particular area. Um, but that's a residual haunting. We call it a haunting just because it's unexplainable, but it's not technically a haunting because the person that you might be seeing might not even be dead. <laughs> so it's not like you're actually being visited by a ghost. Um, the one that people know the most is um, an intelligent haunting, which is what we believe are spirits that used to walk in mortal form, uh, human beings like um, like maybe if you see Abraham Lincoln's ghost, that's an intelligent mm-hmm. haunting. You know, that's okay. it, that's the haunting that we know. Um, a little a less, oh, it's a more rare haunting than a lot of TV shows would leave you, lead you to believe, but it's an inhuman haunting. Inhuman basically means... Things that are haunting you that never walk the earth as mortal, which would be like angels or demons in, mm-hmm. in, in that kind of a way. Um, so you have those kind of, and then you have the poltergeist. And poltergeist is still very hotly debated. A lot of people believe that a lot of poltergeist is, because basically poltergeist just means noisy ghost. Mm-hmm. And that's when you see things flying and levitating and, and all these things that are happening. Um, but the two main theories is that a lot of people believe it's demonic, or even if it's like a lesser demon, and a lot of people will call them imps, where they're lesser demons, they're not the kind of demons that can like possess you necessarily. Um, but there is new research that states it could also have something to do with a person and not an actual spirit at all. Right. Um, a lot of the poltergeist cases have been revolving around mostly, especially... Um, Girls coming into coming coming of age, you know, going yes. through puberty, going through the changes. Um, a lot of times, boys. It can happen to boys too, or sometimes it happens with women who are about to go through menopause, and there's a great hormonal change that's happening. And because if you remove this particular person from the event, the event seems to stop. So it's almost like they're acting as some kind of a conduit, like or a something. trigger for these events. Yeah. I, I, Cause I've also heard, I, I interviewed Barry Taft one time many years ago and, and he was also saying that he thought sometimes people that had epilepsy or, or seizures um, that there might be poltergeist activity related to that. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. I, I mean, when it comes to the, what they call a person trigger, it usually will revolve around somebody that's going through severe events, like emotional or physical mm-hmm. events. And so it could be someone with epilepsy. It could be someone who suffers from seizures. It could be, like I said, a hormonal child that's going from a child to teenager years, um, a woman that's going through a change. Um, a lot of times it could happen, too, with great illness. Like if someone is going through, um, l- let's say they were healthy and then all of a sudden they found out that they had cancer and it's a very big traumatic experience, it's emotional and it's physical. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of people believe that it could be those could be triggers for for those kind of activities to actually take place. Um, but there's really with anything paranormal, unfortunately, the reason it's paranormal is because there is no scientific evidence to prove one way or the other. These are still right. all theories. Yes. Um, and that's why we research. We continue the research that we can one day, like I said, I, I've said to people before, I mean, show the flat earthers that the earth is really round. Mm-hmm. I mean, people don't believe in the paranormal. Well, people didn't believe the earth was round until it was proven. And hopefully one day we will be able to prove that ourselves if we continue this research. I, I, I agree with you. And I think that there will be reasons for at least portions of the paranormal that when we have more more science and more information it, it will appear, it will make sense. Yes. And it will relate to energy, perhaps. Um, when you, when I'm reading the book, I, and I was reading the various cases, um, I, I don't want to give away the whole book. I want people to purchase mm-hmm. it. It's a great book. But let's talk about a little bit of, uh, one of my favorite stories in the book, actually, was uh, the rocking chair story. Oh, and yeah, I, know that yeah. we, I know that we have a little bit of time right before the break. We're going to take a break here in just a few minutes. But let's relate to that because this relates to the story it, uh, that also happened in your home where perhaps a spirit is attached to an object. Yes. Um, and it was such a, I mean, this was one of my favorite cases because it was such a, a bittersweet case. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was it basically, and, and I changed the name of the people. They told me that I could use their names, but I did change their names in the book because I believe in confidentiality, even if they give me permission. Sure. Um, but it, it was just a young family. They were just starting on their way. They were getting ready to have another child. They wanted to expand their house. Um, they have some place with a yard for their kids to play in. And so they bought the house of their dreams and everything was great until I guess you could say mom decided to gift them something that was a little bit more than they expected. And that was a very beautiful handmade rocking chair. And it was, um, and after that we saw children were, or her, their daughter, I call her Bernadette. She's talking to thing something that's not there. And she's usually talking to the rocking chair and having full conversations with this rocking chair. And what I found unique about that situation is if you look into child psychology, unless you have a very advanced child, like um, I have a nephew that's actually in Mensa, and um, I think my niece is probably going to be in Mensa soon, too. Uh, So they're developmentally a little bit ahead of the game. But when you have a child that's on on average, um, usually the idea of um, invisible friends or imaginary friends don't usually come up until around the age of three and a half, four years old. Um, sometimes it usually doesn't happen until about five. Well, we're talking about a little girl who's not even uh, three years old yet. She mm-hmm. was very, very young when this started to happen, or four years old. Um, this, she was very young when this started to happen. And it was before the whole imaginary friend thing should have been. But the parents thought, you know what, this is something that I can maybe pass off as she's a little bit more advanced, a little bit more creative. Her imagination's working a little bit sooner than it should, and that's fine. But then the mother started to watch the rocking chair rocking on its own. And Mm. every time she'd move it, no matter where she'd move it, it would still start rocking back and forth. She'd move it away from the window, thinking it's a breeze. She'd move it away from the fireplace. She Everywhere she moved it, it would rock on its own. Mm-hmm. And I actually had that experience myself uh, when I was doing the investigation. It was something that was very odd. Uh, and that's where um, electric voice phenomenon comes in, and it comes in handy to kind of learn little bits and pieces of uh, what could be going on. I know that we're coming up to the break any moment now. The, the music's going to come crashing in. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we are speaking with Andrea Message. Her book is The Ghost in the Cold Cellar, True Case Files from a Lone Investigator. Andrea, tell our friends who are listening how they can uh, find you online. Uh, well, if you want to find me online, the best place is Facebook. I'm always there. It's facebook.com backslash paranormal Ronin, and that's R-O-N-I-N, and it's all one word, paranormal Ronin. Or you can go to my blog spot, which is blogspot.com, parano- or I'm sorry, paranormalronin.blogspot.com. I'm sorry, I'm just getting over the flu. Uh, but those are the two best places to find me, Facebook, if you want to actually contact me in person and ask me questions or talk to me about any paranormal experiences that you've had. 
Well, you provided the perfect segue. Um, when we come back, I want to talk to you about the tools of the trade. Uh, you describe mm-hmm. some of those in the book, and I know that some people who are not ghost hunters but may be interested in becoming that in the future are people who are just curious. Um, maybe you could tell tell us what some of these tools are and why they work the way they do. My name is Michael Parker. This is The Electric Pyramid. You are listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And uh, once again, we're speaking with Andrea Message, and I keep thinking the music's going to come on, but maybe I'm a little bit ahead of the game. Um, (laughs) Right quick before this happens, EVPs, I have witnessed people recording EVPs in the past. How do you do it? What what do you use? I actually just use uh, my recorders that I got from Walmart. You don't need anything fancy or anything expensive, just a regular digital recorder. Um, I got mine from Walmart, 50 bucks. It's a Sony. It's really nice. You can get them for as cheap as $25, or you can still use the analogs that use the tapes. I know a lot of people that still go old school. Um, you don't need anything fancy, though, for trying to record electric voice phenomenon. Well, okay. Well, I was mistaken. I didn't I didn't even know that you could go analog, but of course, that makes sense. And so the yeah. weird thing about EVPs is that, and and I've been in an investigation where people were recording them. And you're asking these questions, but you don't usually hear, well, I guess you can, but we didn't yeah. hear anything at the time. And yet when you go back and listen to the recordings and you listen closely, you hear these messages sometimes. Yeah. And a lot of one of the theories is, and this is a theory that I actually work with myself, is that spirits are on a different plane than we are. The reason we can't see them or that we can't always hear them is because they actually live on a different frequency. Mm -hmm. And every so often we can hear them or we can see them because our frequencies mesh. But in general, the frequency that they speak or are seen in are the kind of frequencies that we record in with our video cameras and our digital audio recorders. And that's why we tend to be able to see and hear them after the fact. Understood. Well, I hear a weird frequency coming in right now, which is the music that I was (laughs) expecting. My name is Michael Parker. This is the Electric Pyramid. We'll be back in about five minutes with Andrea for our second hour. Hang tight, you guys. (laughs) <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael. This is the second hour, and I've turned my microphone back on so that I can communicate with you, and uh, thanks for bearing with me on that. This is episode 30 of The Electric Pyramid, and uh, we appreciate you staying up late and listening to us. Andrea, before the break, we were talking about EVPs and some of the tools that you use in the field, because I think a lot of people wonder, well, if they're ghosts, that means they're immaterial, in a certain sense. So how would one measure or find them? Maybe you can explain to us some of the hardware that you use in the field and why it works. Uh, Well, if we're going to talk about hardware, obviously, like I said, um, the most important thing to have with you besides your own eyes and ears, because one thing that I always advocate is never rely on a piece of equipment because equipment is, it can fail. I mean, you could lose your batteries, could drain, uh, you could accidentally tip it over and break it like I did with one of my cameras in accident because you're going in the dark and you don't always see everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was an expensive lesson. Um, and, and then a lot of times we have uh, man-made and natural things called electromagnetic fields. Mm-hmm. And you can get that through wiring or piping and it could set like randomly it could set off your K2 meter or your Mel meter, which is an electromagnetic field reader. And so never rely on those 100% without a doubt. Um, There's different experiments that you can do to make them a little less, um, a little less fallible, I should say. But always rely on yourself because you don't want to miss a full body apparition and you don't want to miss hearing something that um, you could maybe hear if you were paying attention. But like I said, I'm I'm sorry, sorry. Well, one of the things you mentioned in the book that I found interesting is that uh, even if even if your gear is working correctly, uh, sometimes the spirits will take the energy from the surroundings, like the batteries that are yep. perhaps in your instruments. Exactly. When a spirit manifests, and again, this is a theory, uh, it wouldn't be paranormal if it was a provable fact, but one of the theories that a lot of us play with is that in order to manifest and to do something that is actually, what, whether it's become a full body apparition or if you have a manipulatable object like a ball and it wants to roll the ball, it has to gain energy from somewhere. And we believe that the electromagnetic fields that are around us, again, there's man-made electromagnetic fields. Um, a lot of times you'll see plumbers using a K2 meter to look at the plumbing or an electrician to look at the wiring. 
Um, so there's all sorts of electromagnetic fields around, and it absorbs that electromagnetic and the energy that's in the air to kind of find the energy in within itself in order to create some sort of a manifestation, whether it's vis- visible to the naked eye or audible to the ear, or if it's something that you capture on camera and you see after the fact and you hear after the fact on an audio recorder. And that's kind of why you feel a lot of people talk about cold spots. Mm-hmm. The ghost itself is not necessarily the cold spot. What it's doing is it's absorbing the energy in the vicinity and it's creating a, like a, a heat passage for itself and it's taking all of that heat and absorbing it and leaving cold spots behind it. So when you feel a cold spot, you know that there's a spirit probably trying to manifest and absorbing all of that energy into itself in order to be able to manipulate an object or to be able to speak to you or to manifest in a way that you can actually physically see. That is incredible. And I would think that if, if, that, is, if that is truly what is happening, then at some point in the near future, that could be a key to, I hate to use the word prove, but yeah. substantiating the existence of whatever these entities are things are, because you would be able to quantify the amount of energy that has been absorbed from a particular space. Well, exactly. And and as you said, as technology becomes like, you know, it grows and it expands every year. I mean, like I said, I just bought a Note 4 and I already hear that the Note 5 is coming out for Samsung. So, I mean, it's always every few months, there's some kind of a new technological advancement. And as the technology advances and we learn to use it in the field, we are getting more and more data that we never had before. I mean, before we actually came with the idea that a spirit's trying to manifest by absorbing the energy around it, and we can maybe measure it using an electromagnetic field reader, or we can measure it in in some sort of a way we didn't know that. We didn't have that kind of a technology before. So we didn't know how to register it. Well, then once the K2 meter started to come out and all of the EMF meters for like practical purposes, like I said, electrical work and plumbing, well, we started to find the kind of purpose that we could actually use it for in paranormal research. And while it's still fallible, I mean, there are still, like I said, because of the fact there is so much man-made and natural EMF, it could cause false readings. We're learning to find different ways to use that technology in the field. Like I'll use one K2 meter as a yes and one K2 meter as a no. And I'll ask very obvious yes questions like, are we inside a building? Am I a woman? Um, To establish a baseline. Yeah, you know, something like something that I know is a yes answer that they would know is a yes answer. Very obvious yeses. And I would ask them to light up the yes box. And then again, I would ask very obvious no. I don't want to see that yes box lighting up anymore. I want to see the no. And then I will switch. I'll say, okay, now this box is no and this box is yes. And then I will ask the same yes questions. And I don't want to see that first box lighting up anymore. I want to see this. So if we're starting to see a pattern where yes is always yes, no matter which box is being used, then we know that it's not a random EMF being emitted, whether naturally or man-made. We know that possibly there is a spirit communicating with us. And maybe in a few years, there's going to be something that's going to be definitive, where it's not going to be man-made or natural EMFs causing an interference. It's going to be definitive that if we get a communication, um, that maybe a spirit is involved. So as we advance in technology and we learn how to use it in the field, there might come a time that we will be able to start saying, well, now we're getting closer to a science rather than just the paranormal. What do you do for yourself uh, when you're prepping for an investigation? I I know that you mentioned in the book and uh, that not, I think a lot of times people think of ghosts or things like that as well. It must be demonic and it's not that that's probably a small percentage, but, but still just to be on the safe side, what do you do? to prep yourself um, emotionally and spiritually before you go on an investigation? It's different for everybody. Um, Again, this is a set of beliefs. And um, being a Catholic, I have a certain set of beliefs before I go into an investigation. Mm -hmm. Uh, But for me personally, I always bless myself with holy water. And I say a, a few of my prayers. And then when I actually get into an investigation, and I usually wear my blessed, I have a rosary, and I have a, and I carry it with me, and I usually wear it around my neck and hide it under my shirt as a form of protection uh, Mm -hmm. for me. But once I get into a place, and this is for anybody, whether you believe, whether you're an atheist, or you know, and 
involved in the paranormal or you're a Baptist or you're a Christian or you're a, you're Jewish. It doesn't matter what your belief system is. What a lot of us do is we automatically say when we come in, we're here to speak to you. We're here to learn about why you're here. We want to learn more about you. We're not here to hurt you or to insult you. We're here to respect you and just learn from you. But you are not allowed to attach to us. You are not allowed to follow us or anything that belongs to us. And what's important that way is because a lot of times what people don't understand is any kind of spirit, whether it's demonic or whether it's... um, in intelligent haunting, it needs an invitation in order to follow you and to attach to you. And if you're, um, if you tell them straight off the bat, at least our belief is, if you tell them straight off the bat that you are not allowed, the invitation is not made, then there's, while this attachments can still happen, it's so far, knock on wood, I have been able to avoid anything attaching to me and bringing that home uh, to my home. But um, I always make sure that I bless myself going in. I make the announcement that no attachment is allowed. I am only there to respectfully learn from them and talk to them and communicate with them, and that's it. And then I will reiterate on my way out that no attachment is allowed, and then I'll bless myself with holy water again and say a few of my prayers and um, make sure that I am protected uh, religiously as much as spiritually and, you know, and, and giving that kind of a command that you're not allowed to attach to me. So that's me personally, again, as a Catholic. Um, everybody does it differently. People do smudging uh, where they take incense and they smudge themselves. Um, a lot of people will psychically prepare themselves. And some people don't do anything. And that's fine if that's uh, how they feel. Um, but for me personally, I always protect myself going in and going out in a religious manner. I think that is reasonable and and, and very respectful to the, the energies that you're dealing with. Because sometimes when I watch paranormal shows on television, I, I've seen people be very cavalier um, and, and arrogant. And mm-hmm. I'll be honest, it's like I, I could talk about certain aspects of the paranormal all day. But I admit when, when it comes to spirits, ghosts, things of this nature, I do get creeped out. And it was one of those things yeah. that um, I have a great deal of healthy respect for. So I, I, sometimes when I see people be cavalier or kind of cocky about it, I, I, I don't know if I don't buy it or I just find it disrespectful or, or both. Um, oh, yeah. And, and a lot of times there are certain people that go in and you can, uh, and in fact, I'm not going to go and point out any um, particular show. I'll just say from a personal experience of a group that I dealt with, um, they kind of idolize the particular show and they base their entire, pardon? I think I know what you're talking about, but go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> you probably, everybody probably does. I make fun of this particular guy so often and right. I, my New Year's resolution was to try and ease up on him just a bit. Uh, it's very hard, though. Um, but I, I have one particular group that I worked with that just idolized this particular show, and they emulated it in their investigations when I actually went and did an investigation with them. And you could almost feel the negative energy around them. It's almost like they were a magnet for negative energy because of the way that they were doing their investigations. And they were taking that negative energy from every investigation and bringing it with them. And you could just, it's almost like it was feeding off of them. Uh, well, I, when you, I, I could, you know, it's, ugh, I, it's, I it's could one see of those that. situations I, I can't. Uh. I would think that after a while that would, listen, I, I, first of all, I think it's dangerous. I think it's irresponsible. Yeah. And I would think over time, I mean, how many times can you jump out of a plane? I, you know, it's just, yeah, exactly, you're just, yeah. just going to accumulate a lot of bad vibes. I don't know. I just, I have a problem with yeah. that personally. And now for me, when you're dealing like when you're dealing with a demon, if you're dealing with a demonic kind of, and for people who watch certain TV shows, I'm telling you that um, these kind of where they're constantly getting possessed or they're constantly getting scratched and beat up on, I can count on my hand how many times I've had those kind of investigations where I actually felt that there was a demonic presence. Um, but even when you're when you're dealing with a general haunting, um, you're dealing with people that used to be people. Mm -hmm. And people were like, you know, if there's a good person, a lot of times in death, they're still going to be good people. And I believe like I call them borderline demonic. And people always ask me, what's borderline demonic mean? And it means that there are people in life who are just so evil and manipulative 
and just mean that they stay that way in death. And sometimes I actually feel that they're left there by an evil presence to continue to be that mean, evil, vindictive person. And it. why would you want to go someplace and poke them in the chest? You know, it's like poking a bear in the chest and waiting for something to happen. And, and it's just, I, you know, I just don't really understand why people would find that fun. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it, you know, you, when you're dealing with people that used to be just like us, you want to be respectful. You want to treat them the way you'd want to be treated personally. I don't want someone to come in my face and start yelling at me and, calling me ugly and stupid and, you know, and, and just yelling at me for no reason. And I'm sitting there like, what did I do? I'm just sitting here minding my business. You came to me. Sure. I didn't come to you. And, you know, what? so I, I, I feel that everybody should treat a person or even a spirit the way that you'd want to be treated. Not only because it's just the right thing to do, but because it's the safe thing to do. Because I have encountered spirits that... I don't believe are demonic, but I do believe are intelligent hauntings of people that were just so dark and evil in their life and that that's how they are in their death. And I don't want them to focus on me for negative reasons. I don't want to give them any more reason to be more negative than they already are. Well, you talk about in the book, um, you talk about the first ward schoolhouse mm -hmm. and I believe that's, that's where the room is. Um, you had, a physical attack. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Uh, that was in the cold cellar. And that's how the yes. title of the book actually came to be was ghost in the cold cellar. And, and there was a very not so nice spirit in that particular room. And in this particular case, I'm, I'm guessing that this is one of the kind of entities that you're talking about where this is just a person gone really wrong and yes. uh, they have remained that way. Exactly. And, and like I said, I firmly, like I said, a lot of people, again, it's based on your religious beliefs, but I believe in God and I believe in Satan. And mm -hmm. I, I honestly believe that there are sometimes they say, you know what, we don't need to leave a demon in this place because there's already someone bad enough to cause enough trouble to actually hurt somebody if they wanted to. And we're just going to let them do what they do. And I, I honestly believe that sometimes those kind of spirits are left behind intentionally. Uh, and I believe this is one of those spirits. I don't think it was, it's demonic, but I don't think it was someone that was very good in life either. Um, and there's a lot of things I didn't talk about in the book because I didn't feel comfortable talking about it in the book um, pertaining to the person that they believe the spirit might be because really? I was not able to find any evidence to substantiate it. And I don't want to spread rumors. Um, that's not my, that's not the point of investigating. Right. Um, but what I did hear that pertains to this particular spirit was not very good. It was, it was one of the evilest things that I could possibly think of. Oh, um, yeah. And, and I believe that that's the spirit that was there. And I, I spoke to Scotty Rorick, who is a renowned uh, psychic medium that was actually there at the time. Yeah. And he basically said that the spirit does not like strong women. And mm -hmm. that it, because as soon as I got done and, you know, I, I, I believe that I am a strong person. I have a very sure. strong, I'm a type A personality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, so I sat there and, and, and I, I did nothing. I was doing nothing to the spirit. I was listening to somebody that was explaining the whole coal cellar and the story of the coal cellar in the room. And I actually felt four fingers on one side of my throat and a one finger, which would be the thumb on the other side of my throat. And I could actually feel it clenching. Like you could feel the squeezing as if someone is trying to squeeze my throat. And I actually couldn't breathe very well. I couldn't swallow. I was starting to get very white and people were asking me what's wrong. Um, and I didn't want to say anything out loud because there were people there that were only there for basically the thrill. They had never, they weren't in paranormal investigators. They were there to learn what it was like to be an investigator and what it was sure. like to be in a haunted house. But they, and I knew somewhere deep inside of me, I knew that if I said something, someone was going to freak out and I didn't want to traumatize anyone. So I'm trying to get it in my own head. And finally, I just went back to making the sign of the cross on my knee with my finger and saying a prayer in my head. And then finally, after I was done saying the prayer, I said, in my head, you have to let go. I did not give you permission to touch me. And it immediately started letting up. And then it kind of, I it just hung in the room and I could see people were out of sorts. So finally I did ask, well, does anybody feel that energy in the room just kind of really changed and took a negative 
and finally saw everyone was just like, yeah, I just, I felt, and as soon as it let go of me, it almost like started to attach to everyone else and started to feed them very negative vibes. And finally, the two people I knew were going to be traumatized, I looked at them, I could read them like a book. I mean, they got up and they left that place so fast and never came back for the rest of the, because uh, this was a uh, fundraiser for the First Word Schoolhouse and it was a couple day event and they never came back after that. They did not return for the second investigation. They were so traumatized. I mean, even this big burly man leaves his poor wife behind and he says, I'm out of here. And then his wife gets up and she turns around and she said, this place isn't right. I, you guys should just, everybody should just get out of here. And all of a sudden people just started leaving one by one and just following suit. And there was only two of us that wanted to stay. And finally, a few people got brave when they saw we wanted to stay and decided to stay too. Um, and when I went back and I listened to the EVPs of that, I heard what sounded like um, sit down, like someone ordering me to sit down. And that was right before I felt the hand on my throat. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, we're talking about it. And um, one of the investigators asked, well, do you have something against women specifically? And all of a sudden, I hear this just evil laugh. Just this kind of like, it sounded like a mad scientist going, Whoa. like, you know, just this real low, deep, very scary sounding laugh. And, and I knew that it, it knew what it was doing. And it, and it was just the strangest thing that ever, that I had ever encountered at the time. That is really disturbing. It is. It was kind of disturbing. You know, for a paranormal investigator, it was actually kind of exciting and interesting. I understand. Um, because it's something that you can learn from and that you can write in your notes about, like, okay, so this happened. This could be the reason why. Let's start to figure out more reasons and let's start to kind of work on what I can ask him the next night uh, when I go back to investigate and see if I could get some answers from this thing. But for somebody that's not a paranormal investigator and is not prepared, and that's such a big thing. So many people want to do this because they see ghost hunters or ghost adventures on TV and think, I, oh, that looks so fun. And they're there for the wrong reasons. They're not mm -hmm. prepared. And they get so traumatized by something like that. And rightfully so. I mean, it's a very traumatic experience when you're physically attacked. And that's why I always say, make sure you're in this for the right reasons. Make sure if you're going to be a paranormal investigator, it's because you want to further the research of paranormal field and not because you think it's cool and exciting. Because one day you're going to encounter something that you don't know how to handle and you're not going to be emotionally prepared for it. And it always surprises me. I guess it shouldn't. But what, what you're describing, where, where people want to do it for, you know, kind of a rush or a thrill. Yeah. I just like, I, I, man, go to a, go, go to an amusement park or something because. Go skydiving. I, it's safer. Yeah. I, I, I totally just don't get that because to me, it is such a heavy idea that, yeah. you know, it, it's not something to take lightly. It's not, it's not no. really, it's not a hobby per se. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it can be if you, if you are, thoroughly educated and prepared like yourself. I don't think hobby is the right word for it, but yeah, yeah. I, I, people that are, I would think that the vast majority of the population is not set to do this kind of work. No. And I've encountered that before. Like it's a, that one team that I encountered that were that they worship this one particular show and they mm -hmm. live their whole life as if they were in the show. Or then you mm -hmm. have these, um, what I call the entertainment paranormal groups. Sure. Where they're strictly in it to try and get a television show. Yeah. And they're, they're very secretive about, they think that they've got an edge over other groups and they don't want to share their techniques with other groups because they don't want other groups stealing their ideas. They're in it for the wrong reasons. They're not there for the client. They're not there for paranormal research. They're there to try and make money off of becoming the next Zach Bagans. Mm -hmm. And it, it that is so harmful, not only to the field, because that's when you get the skeptics looking at us and saying, oh, look at those people, you know, and using that as an example of who we all are. Mm -hmm. But it's very harmful to the clients. If you're there because you want a TV show and you're not actually doing this for research, what good are you to a client? Right. It's and completely you could disingenuous. be causing more harm than good. Sure. And you could eventually get hurt doing it. Oh, yeah. Or you could hurt the clients. I've had so many people that have come in there and they watch TV or they see like a movie like the like uh, The Conjuring and they think mm -hmm. that they're the Warrens all of a sudden. They think that they're like Lorraine and Ed Warren and they could go and cleanse a home. <sighs> and so they get in there and they try to tell the spirit to leave and then they walk out and 
their clients are left with a really ticked off, angry spirit. And now they don't know what to do because these people who are not equipped and are not trained for exorcisms of homes have just riled things up to in the nth degree and they don't know what to do. And I have been in this for 10 years and I refuse to do any kind of cleansing, cleansing of homes. If somebody came to me and I said, I have a spirit, I want it gone. The first thing I would do is say, well, I can help you make sure that that's what you're dealing with and that it's not some natural thing that maybe you haven't thought of. And if I do find evidence of a haunting going on, I can refer you to, and I would say like, you know, depending on their religion, I usually recommend a priest who mm-hmm. is actually equipped and trained in blessing homes and cleansing homes and exercising homes of spirits or some member of the clergy. But I would never, ever do it myself, no matter how long I've been in this field, because I have not researched exorcisms other than learning about the exorcists themselves or the cases of exorcisms. But I wouldn't say just because I watched the exorcist on, you know, the TLC channel or whatever, that I know how to do an exorcism now. So you just do so much more harm when people are there for the wrong reasons. I get it. Well, let me ask you this, because one of the things that kind of uh, stuck out to me when, when you were talking about the first ward schoolhouse and, and I admit I was, I was, I was reading through that chapter at the end today kind of quickly because I want to make sure I got through the book before the yeah. show. But um, here's something I didn't really understand. Um, mm-hmm. You were mentioning that they had some beds from the Lent building yeah. in, 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 in the First Ward schoolhouse. Yes, they did. They actually yep. have uh, some of the beds that are actually from the Lent mansion um, that they had purchased and brought with them and put them in one of the bedrooms up in uh, one of the top stairs. It, um, it, it There's like uh, the main floor, then there's the basement, and then there are two more floors above that. There's the attic and then the second floor where all the bedrooms are. And yeah, they do have some of the Lent Mansion beds there. Because that just seemed like you're, you're courting trouble by doing that. Am I wrong? Yeah. You can be. I mean, just because, uh, and I want to say this to a lot of people, because I've had people that are so terrified of buying a home if they find out that somebody died there right. or that there was a killing there. It doesn't necessarily mean that something is going, that you're going to be haunted. Um, you can have a building that's two, 300 years old and not have any spirits. And then you have a house like mine that's newly built and you could have spirits in it, you know, because maybe you built near uh or like you stirred up a spirit or you know from the land or or like i tell people just because it's a a cemetery doesn't mean that it's haunted doesn't mean ghosts are everywhere because nine out of ten a spirit's not going to be attached to its body it's going to be attached to an object or a place in life that meant something to them right and that's usually unless they're buried with that object they nine out of ten are not going to be haunting the cemetery well it does happen it's it's not likely. So just because you have an object that's old and that has a history to it does not necessarily mean that a spirit's going to follow you, but there is a chance that it could happen. Well, when you mentioned the Limp Mansion, I mean, that just kind of upped the odds to me. I, I thought yeah. that was stacking oh, yeah. the with deck. The Mansion, yeah. Um, but what, the one thing that I do have to say about that is that um, the owners of the First Word Schoolhouse are uh, – He's a paranormal investigator himself. He's been in the paranormal field for a very long time. And he is somebody that really knows what he's doing. Um, And he knows how to handle spirits. And he knows what he he knows, especially like now that he actually lives at the schoolhouse. So he actually knows how to handle these spirits a lot better than just an average person. Like, let's say um, you as somebody who's not a paranormal investigator that hasn't been doing it for decades, goes and buys the beds from the Lent Mansion and brings them to your house. Mm. Now you're playing a little bit more with fire. Um, And while it's not necessarily the the best thing to do for everybody, uh, this person does happen to know their business pretty good as a paranormal investigator for many, many years. Um, So he has a good handle on it. Gotcha. I wouldn't recommend it to a lay person, but if you've been in investigating for like as long as I have, I have actually taken in objects that I know have spiritual attachments in order to study them. Um, and I study them in a very kind of clean area. I have a house that is a family home that nobody lives in and I will take it to that home. And that's where I do a lot of my research of haunted objects, but I've been doing this for, like I said, going on 11 years now. Um, so it's something that I'm comfortable with that I wouldn't recommend to everybody to go out and seek haunted objects because then you are playing with fire. If you're not an investigator and you don't know what you're doing. 
I get it. Well, let's let's jump back a little bit because I was reading um, – <sighs> Another another thing in the book that interested me, when you were talking about the Mission Point Resort, the theater there, and there was a couple of spirits in there, and you mm-hmm. sat down in a particular chair in this theater, and you, chair, yeah. Yeah, and you felt this chair vibrating, and other mm-hmm. people had felt the chair vibrate as well. Yes. Um, I love Harvey's chair. I mean, that, that place, the Mission Point Resort is just, it's such an awesome place to visit. I mean, if anybody's ever been able to go to Mackinac Island, it's literally like taking a step back in time with horse-drawn carriages, no motor vehicles. Um, everybody's either walking, riding bikes, or taking a horse. I mean, it's just so beautiful, so quiet and peaceful. But the spirits at uh, the Mission Point Resort uh, Theater is just it's really fun. I mean, they're, they're practical jokesters. They're pranksters. Um, it, it's a very interesting place. But Harvey was a student at um, at the time this the resort used to be a college for very mm-hmm. four years I mean one co- one class graduated before it was turned over um, and he was one of the first graduating class and the story goes and again this is an alleged story because there are other things that have come into question and there's still an ongoing investigation that I can't discuss right now but the mm-hmm. main story that people know about Harvey is that he was a student he was in love with this girl and she rejected him very publicly. She said, you know, you were just a summer fling and it wasn't a serious thing because he wanted to marry her. And he, she's mm-hmm. like, I don't know what you're talking about. This isn't serious. I just wanted to have fun. Sure. And then the story is that he went and committed suicide on the cliffs behind what it's now the Straits Lodge. And he was very big into the theater. And there's a notch in the chair. And it's the only one that has a notch in it. And that was his particular chair. That's the chair that he likes to sit in. And even today, he could be seen sitting in that particular chair. The the notch that's in the chair, what does that signify? Did he put that there or did someone else put that there? He put that there. That was something that he did in the course of his life. Uh, that was his that, that was his favorite chair. That was whenever he was involved in the theater, that's something that... Uh, that was that was his place. That was basically his calling card, and, and they left it, it there. They didn't replace it. And this is the same spirit that some women have mentioned. They thought it had embraced them or tried to get in bed with them. Correct? Yeah, he's he is a very he's a big prankster. Um, like if you clean, a lot of the maintenance men will clean something, and he will mess it right back up immediately. And then they'll try cleaning it again, and then once again he'll put it back to the way it was, just as a joke. Um, there was a case of a woman who actually was sleeping in his bedroom, uh, his old dorm room, and she was laying in bed and her husband had gone into the bathroom and she felt a body lying down next to her and an arm go around her. And she thought it was her husband. And when she looked, there was nobody there, but there was an imprint in the bed Mm -hmm. and she heard the toilet flush in the bathroom and realized her husband was in there and just absolutely scared the heck out of the poor woman. And mm-hmm. he does things like that. He he likes to touch women. Um, sometimes just kind of grope them a little bit just to tease them, goose them, you know, just, just little practical jokes to let people know he's there and just have a little fun. Well, yeah, I, I listen, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't want to be graphic, but I'm going to admit, I mean, this guy's pretty forward. It sounds like, and yes, he is. <laughs> and, and when you, when you say that, that the, the chair was vibrating and you mentioned that someone else, it just, like I say, I don't want to get graphic, but I'm like, I, <laughs> do you know what I'm getting at? Sitting here? in his lap, or <laughs> yes, and and you're you're telling me that you know, I, well, in the book, you know, you mentioned that you hear a couple of words that you think it's like, I don't know, I, I just, I, I I don't even know what to say. I was just like, wow, this. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Harvey is a practical joker, and it's and you know what? And I tried to find any kind of a cause for the vibration, like any kind of a heating system or an air mm-hmm. system turning on, and there just literally was nothing. And I mean, you moved one chair down, and the vibration had stopped. You move one chair to the other side, the vibration had stopped. You sit back down in the chair, and it's no vibrating. And then all of a sudden, it'll start to vibrate out of nowhere and kind of shake on its own, and. You could feel a presence there, and like I said, as this is happening, and I'm talking about it with another girl who's explaining the fact that um, she felt the vibration, too, whenever she'd sit in that chair. Then all of a sudden we hear this this voice. It's a male voice, definitely, and it sounds like it's saying something like stroken, (laughs) 
people are stroking. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and it's, which is weird. And kind of like somebody's stroking you. And, yes. and there were no men in, in the room at the time. Um, the only man that was there was in a soundproof uh, soundstage. And again, that's soundproof because that's where a lot of the like recording would happen. And it has to be perfectly soundproof so sound doesn't leak in or out. So the only voices that should have been there was my own and Kimberly, who was the other investigator with me. Well, that was that was an amusing story, and it was just it, it yeah. stuck in my mind when I was reading it. And um, but but let's talk some more about that because he was not the only spirit that was in that theater. No, there was also well, there's a lot of spirits that we believe in the theater. One is called the opera singer, um, but one of the better known ones next to Harvey is a little girl that they named Lucy. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a very shy little girl. She is, they say she's about maybe seven or eight years old. Um, the people that have seen her say she's very young. She hides from men, especially. Uh, the only men that she really likes are the ones that she knows on a daily basis that work there. Um, and uh, Cornelius is what I called him in the book. Um, mm -hmm. he, obviously, it's not his real name, but um, that's one that she actually attaches to because he's there all the time. And so she's very comfortable with him. But she mostly comes around girls and women. And even then, she's very shy. And it took her while she did start to kind of open up and you could get lots of experiences with her. It was the second time I came back. That's not in the book. It'll be in the second book when I revisit. Um, that was when she actually started to interact a lot more with me on, on a physical basis where I actually gave her a toy and she played with the toy um, and I put down glitter and she played with the glitter. Interesting. Um, but she's a very shy little girl. We don't know. Mission Point is near the Mission House. Mm -hmm. And the Mission House used to be for Native American children. Um, and that's where they would get their education. And so many children died of tuberculosis there. Um, and, and what they did was they put them in the basement to try and cool their fevers. But because the basement was damp, it caused pneumonia. And a lot of kids were dying from pneumonia. Um, so there were so many children that died in that place. And since it's only a hop, skip, and a jump from the actual uh, the actual theater, I thought, well, maybe little Lucy is a child from the mission house that had passed away. Mm-hmm. And, well, one of the, uh, so that was a very interesting case. Well, one of the things I always wonder about is spirits. It's it's kind of the like the you know if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there, do you hear it? It's like the, these spirits when no one is there to witness them. And in, for example, this theater where you've got you know the little girl, you've got Harvey. There's a kind of a darker, heavier spirit there. When, when no one is there to witness them and they're on this other frequency, whatever it is, do you ever wonder what spirits do when there is no one to witness them? Do you, you know, what do they, do they interact with each other? Do you ever think about that? I, I do. And I do believe that they interact with each other. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, and, and again, it depends on the kind of haunting that we're talking about. If we're talking sure. about residual, again, not a haunting. If right. we're talking about inhuman, a lot of their, their goal is to interact with people, whether it's on a positive or negative basis, depending on angel demon. Mm -hmm. um, so their goal is to actually interact with people. But when it comes to a human spirit, I just believe they go about their business in and out, mm -hmm. you know, doing what they've got to do. And a one theory that I thought was very interesting came from a Catholic priest. And again, we're talking about heaven is above us, hell is below us. And we believe in a place called purgatory. Well, where's mm -hmm. purgatory? Could purgatory be on our level in a different frequency? And these spirits are actually in purgatory trying to somehow repent of venial sins in order to go to heaven. Or maybe they don't realize they're dead. Or maybe they just have some reason that they just can't let go of this life yet and, mm -hmm. and cross over. And so they're stuck in this purgatory. And maybe that's why they're there. And, and, and so I believe that if they're stuck in this purgatory, they're not waiting to communicate with us. They're trying to go about their business to figure out how they can cross over to where they belong. And they'll communicate with each other or they'll just walk around or they'll do what they normally do. It's just like, like right now, you know, just because like when I hang up the phone and the conversation's over, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to put on my pajamas. I'm mm -hmm. going to watch TV. My life will go on. I mean, you mm -hmm. don't see what I'm doing, but it's going to continue. And that's how I feel it is with intelligence spirits as well. No, that makes sense to me. I, it was kind of a thought experiment, but it, I mean, yeah, that, that's what I think 
must be the case as well. Um, yeah. It's just because I imagine these places where, you know, you maybe you've got an innocent little girl, you've got the cantankerous young man, and then you've got some kind yeah. of dark, heavy person over there, and they're all kind of cohabitating within this one particular space. Um, you know, it, I, you know, what, yeah. what's happening there? I just, I, and well, yeah, I did ask on the second time that I was in the investigation, the next time, the next following year I came back, I asked if, uh, Lucy and Harvey were friends. And one of the things that I did get was, yes, they are friends. Um, that Good. little Lucy does like Harvey. So mm-hmm. obviously there must be some kind of a communication between the two because she seemed comfortable enough to acknowledge on more than one occasion that Harvey was her friend. Okay. Um, well, another thing that you, you mentioned in the book, and this is something I actually have some personal experience with, not in this particular location, but you talk about the Paulding light and, yeah. You know your 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 research there and your investigation, um, because I did some stuff for a Travel Channel a while back on the the Marfa lights, which is kind of a yeah, yeah. a similar phenomena, and like what you discovered in Paulding, in Marfa it's the same thing. A lot of people think that it's car lights, um, yeah. but just like your investigation, what we discovered is you can. Pretty much, if if you stay there long enough and do the right research, you can tell what the difference is between the car lights and this phenomenon. And the or, yes, exactly. So um, for our audience, and that was, I'm sorry. Well, for the audience, kind of tell tell them a little bit about the Paulding light because some people may not have heard of this, and and just tell us yeah. about what you experienced there. Well, the Paulding light is, like you say, very similar to the Marfa lights. It's also very similar to the Gordon lights um, yeah. in Arkansas. And their stories are very similar. Um, in, in both Gordon and in the Paulding Lights, it talks about a railroad man uh, working on the railroad, gets killed by a train. Uh, the driver of the train, the engineer, feels very remorseful. And some of the lights you see is the train going back and forth, and the smaller lights is the lantern of the uh, railroad brakeman that got killed on the train. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, they're very similar stories. Yes. But what I did find, I took a high power telescope. And this is what I was on the Weather Channel, and when they did uh, just this recent year, they re- or last year, late last year, they released the episode of um, Strangest Weather on Earth 2, and they actually talked about the Paulding Lights, and I was very upset because oh, that was a disaster, but actually, I'm not going to go into that. Wait, 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 wait. Hold, hold on. Is okay. it, um, <laughs> the, but the episode did come out? The episode is out, and I was so excited to see it, and it was completely misrepresented. Um, I was, I felt like I was completely misled by, um, and I'm not blaming the weather channel. I actually blame pioneer TV when they approached me about my Paulding lights videos and if they wanted to use it. And if I would like to speak on it, I said very emphatically, this is something that's part of their history in, uh, waters meet Michigan and in Paulding, Michigan. This is something that's embedded in their legends and their lores. And if you're going to do this debunking where you're very disrespectful to the people that live there and don't even give it a fair shake, then I don't want to participate. Well, they brought me out, and for two hours I was there talking about the paranormal angle. And on the episode, I was on for 10 seconds looking like I was some kind of a black-robed, like I should be in a black robe with a hood and, you know, mm-hmm. chanting to the Paulding Lights and worshiping it the way they made it sound, like I was a dedicated follower rather than a paranormal researcher. And uh, then they get this... Unfortunately, I, I believe me. I I hear you. I I actually have a background in reality television as well, and yep. and, and I have friends that um, have been asked to be on shows, and 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 they're like, you know, and and I've been on shows as well, and it's unfortunately what you're describing happens more often than oh, not, yeah. and it's and it's and like I said, it would have been perfectly fine. I would have even let them use my video, but I wouldn't have participated. I had to sure. go and get a hotel and. You know, I'm standing out there in freezing cold, 35 degree temperature with no coat on because I wanted to look pretty. And that that was like more important than not getting frostbite. Right. And they were very, they said, no, we're going to be, do-. it almost led me to believe that they were going to be doing, yeah, they're going to try and find a weather explanation for the polling lights. But then they would at least do a by the by, well, this mystery is solved, but other mysteries at the lights are still happening and that still need to be explained. Mm-hmm. But they didn't do that. They did this. This is what it is. Case closed. What did they say it was? What, Just the cars? Car lights. Car lights. Yeah. And and what was what was bad that I thought they could have at least represented instead of making me sound like I was some kind of a Ouija board using dousing rod, um, <laughs> like worshiper of the lights, you know, instead mm-hmm. of a researcher. 
they could have at least said, I did tell them in this letter, and I still have the email to this day, that um, I took a high power telescope and I did look and I did see car lights. And that was 100% undeniable. I mean, you just need a high power telescope and you could see them. But can you please explain to me how a car light would appear on my foot? <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. I had a green ball of light hovering on top of my foot. Now, if that were a car, I don't think I would, I'd, I'd be wearing a prosthetic right now because yes. my foot would have been crushed. And I saw a light from coming from the wood where there are no paths for walking. Or I mean, it's so dense woods coming out broad daylight, not even 50 feet in front of us, big balls of red light. How do you explain that as a car if there's no car attached to them in big, broad, light, you know, daylight? And they didn't even mention any of that. And they didn't mention about the electric voice phenomenon that I was able to capture of Native American chanting and of actual communications where I would hear a person speaking to us and laughing at us and answering our questions. Um, and they just kind of bypassed all of that, said case closed, and it just upset me. It irks me so much. But <sighs> I um, but yeah, there's a lot going on in the Paulding lights that there are car lights out there, but the real Paulding lights do exist, and they're not what people think they are. I saw the footage that your that your brother shot that was on your website, and I've got to say it was very interesting to me. It looked it looked very similar to what we saw in in Marfa, and then that sometimes the ball it'll start out as a single ball and split, or it'll be a couple of balls, and it will come together. It changes colors, it disappears um, inexplainably. Um, I, what do if you were to venture a guess, what do you think? What do you think the Paulding light is? If I were to venture a guess, um, I honestly don't know what the lights are. To be Mm -hmm. perfectly honest, I think that there are spirits at the Paulding light that are actually watching the phenomenon happen right with us. Because the EVPs that I was able to capture sound just as amazed at the lights as we do. And whenever we did ask about, are you the cause of the lights? We never got a definitive answer. We never got a yes. Um, so I can't say that whatever spiritual activity, because we actually, I mean, we had more than just uh, that. We had like in, in the snow, it was just my brother and I doing research and it had snowed out. We actually saw footprints forming in front of us in the snow as we're watching it happen. Uh, so there is spiritual activity at the lights, but I don't believe or necessarily know for a fact that it's caused by the spiritual energy. It could be a weather phenomenon that we don't understand. It could be paranormal in a maybe a different kind of spirit. Um, a lot of people believe it could be extraterrestrial. Uh, we just don't know. But all I know is there are car lights, but the light that was on my foot and the light that was 50 feet away from us are definitely not car lights. They cannot be explained away as car lights. And I can't explain them away by any weather phenomenon that I know of. It. It's not a corpse candle. It's not a uh, ball lightning. I don't know what it is. And, and right. I, I say that very, I know there's spirits there, but I don't know if it has anything to do with spirits, with extraterrestrial kind of a thing, or uh, some natural phenomenon we don't know at this time. Um, the, it's just the, an, the oddest phenomenon ever. The light that was on your foot, what color and how big was it? It was a green ball of light. And actually, you could see the green cast on my boot and on the snow around it because it had snowed that day. And you could see the green. I mean, it was casting its own light. And it was maybe the size of – it was a little bigger than a baseball. Did it, it come probably, to you? It was right because I had what had happened was I didn't know what it, where it came from. I was turned around and we were packing up our equipment, getting ready to leave. And then I turned back to go get my camera. And when I bent down to get my camera, it was already there, just hovering over my foot. And I'm staring at it for several seconds. And then finally, I turn around to tell my brother, guys, come here, look at this real quick. And when my brother Andy came to look, it was already gone. And mm-hmm. it just disappeared as quietly as it came. Did you and try to reach down know. and touch it at all? I, you know what? I didn't solely because I was a little shocked. Sure. I mean, when you see a ball of light on your foot, the first instinct is not to touch it. Right. I get it. I get <laughs> it's it. more to like, what the heck is that? And, mm-hmm. and and then to get somebody to, hey, hurry up quick. Look at this. I need you to verify that you see this too. And, you know, unfortunately, it left as quickly as it came and as silently as it came. But, um, no, I never did try to touch it. Okay. I was just curious. So did, 
Yeah. May, did you do another thing as well besides the the Weather Channel on on the Paulding lights, or was just, was that the only thing? For me, only the only thing that I did was um, the Weather Channel. But okay. um, Ben Hansen, who appears in my book in the First Word Schoolhouse chapter. He was on a series called Fact or Faked Paranormal sure. Files, which yeah. was on the Sci-Fi Channel, and they did come out to do the Paulding Lights, um, and they did find they left believing the Paulding Lights was unexplainable. Really interesting. Okay, yes. well that's good. I mean, because usually the easy thing for TV shows to do is just say, "Hey, it's it's the car lights, and we're out of here." Yeah, yeah, and they did. I mean, they had a police car. Where, where they tried to show where they could try to see flickering lights of the police car. They had a test where they would turn the brights on and brights off. And they said that based on their experience, they were not able to recreate the lights with the car. And in fact, when they did not have the car lights on, they were still seeing the lights and there were no other traffic on the road because the police had blocked the traffic so nobody could come down there. Mm -hmm. And so they went around with Geiger testers to test for swamp gases and they could not find an explanation for the polling lights either. Right. When you were when you were doing the EVPs, did you get a sense for who these spirits were that were witnessing the lights with you? Did you get or any type of sense about if they were their origin? To or me, I, I mean, if I have to take a wild guess, it sounded Native American to me because sure. we did have what sounds like what we call vocalizations, which is a Native American chanting where it's mm -hmm. not your, they're not words. They're it's kind of like powwow music where you just hear like vocalization kind of chanting. And then you hear a couple of the voices that we heard. It was the same voice a few times, and it had an accent um, that wasn't a recognizable accent. It wasn't like a foreign accent. It sounded like a Native American accent. Because um, I, I live in an area where we have a lot of uh, tribes, various tribes around us. Mm -hmm. And it had the same kind of vocal accent that a lot of the tribal members that I speak to have. And so I believe that there was something Native American in that particular area. And that is where the Lockview Desert tribe is from. And mm -hmm. they came around the 1800s. They were there at the turn of the century. So uh, at the late 1800s when they settled in the area. So it's possible that it could even be ancestors of the current Lockview Desert tribe. I get it. I, I, I understand. And it makes it sound like the light itself is indigenous as well. Because when you describe that scenario, it makes me think that the Indians probably witnessed it back then as well. Oh, yes. And then they do say that one of the legends is that it is a very spiritual place for the Native Americans of that particular tribe and that they hold the lights to be something very spiritual. It's almost like they say the lights are trying to tell a story mm -hmm. and they're trying to communicate a story to you. And that's something that was very big in, in for Native Americans back in the day uh, where they would tell stories. And it was a lot of their legends were word of mouth and reenactments of different stories. And they think that that's how the lights are communicating with them as well, by telling the story in a oral sort of a aspect. It's amazing. When when we did the uh, the Marfa lights thing, we we had some similar stories that, that predated car lights, because a lot of people wanted to say there were car lights there as well. And there are two yeah. uh, major freeways that come together, and you can see car lights. But one of the things that we were looking into was the fact that, that it could possibly be plasma. Um, and what I've kind of learned about earth lights or spook lights or whatever, the, you know, there are several places on the planet where um, these things, these inexplicable balls of light, energy, whatever they are, up here and listen, I, like yourself, I don't have an answer for what yeah. it is. Um, even if it turns out to be a natural causation, even if it yeah. is plasma or something, it's still incredible. Oh yeah, and and I have we have encountered corpse candles before, or they're also called will o' the wisps or jack o' lanterns, mm -hmm. and that basically is you need a certain amount of decaying vegetation matter and swamp gases to release from the earth in the right atmospheric conditions right. to create these. So they're very rare things, uh, but these lights that we're seeing, they're coming out when it's completely frozen over under like six to eight feet of snow and it's freezing cold outside and it's happening when it's very nice, beautiful day in the high seventies. I mean, especially in the winter time, you're not going to get a lot of swamp gases or vegetation sure. decaying because it's all frozen. Mm -hmm. So we can't really just, it's not necessarily not an atmospheric thing, but we can't say that it's like a will of the wisp because you have to have a certain atmospheric condition and a certain level of swamp gases and everything to create that. 
So we don't really know what it is, but it's just, it is a very fascinating phenomenon, especially when you see the true lights. It's very fascinating. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been speaking with Andrea Message. Her book is The Ghost in the Cold Cellar, True Case Files from a Lone Investigator. And Andrea, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and staying up late with us. Tell our audience one more time how they can find you on Facebook and your blog spot. You can find me on facebook.com backslash paranormal Ronin. That's all one word, and it's R-O-N-I-N, paranormal Ronin. Or you can find me at paranormalronin.blogspot.com. And Andrea is trying to sell 2,000 units of the book before February, I believe, and it is worth your money. It's a great book. If you love chilling, spine-tingling ghost stories and you want to find out how to do it yourself, some of that information is here. So please look for her online, purchase her book, and we want to say thank you to Llewellyn for um, forwarding me a copy. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I will treasure it in my my library. Andrea, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Oh, and I do want to say that if I do reach my 2000 goal, what I'm going to be doing with the residual check is donating some of it to a no-kill animal shelter here in town uh, that rescues animals from other kill shelters around the country um, in order to find them good homes. So it's going to go to a worthy cause. You were just completely awesome. (laughs) I try to be. (laughs) That is fantastic. Well, Andrea, thank you so much. And I hope that you'll come back on the show in the future. When are you going to try to do the next book? Um, I'm actually working on my next book right now, and I'm actually working on a children's book uh, that's going to be for children who've had paranormal experiences or for families who are dealing with paranormal experiences with children in the house. That is great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think the clock is coming up on us. I think we're going to time out of here. Andrea, thank you so much to my audience. I say thank you. Um, Joe, thank you as always. And I think you have something special to uh, take us out with. 